So it's your it's position my, that th this child drowned unattended in the bathtub. Yes. Um, this is a normal routine. I didn't overdo it. I just hated myself for what happened. The fact that I left her is is why she died. Okay. So when you told the police that um, that after spraying her for a pro prolonged period of time in her face with the jets running in the tub that the victim no longer had any fight, you just made that up? I don't remember saying no fight. I, I, I think I was just, like I said, I was just doing anything that not. We are about to watch the parole hearing of a man who drowns his two-year-old niece in the bathtub. At the end of the hearing, we'll unpack it with all of the details. What's unique about this hearing is that the parole board takes a very different kind of approach. They seem to actually ask questions and try to get answers. But with that, let's jump. James Brooks, Mr. Cicello, today is Monday, March 18, 2024. And this is a hearing of the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles. The following board members are present this morning and by stating their names on the record, certify they have reviewed all statutorily required documents and available pertinent information in preparation of this hearing. Good morning, panel member Dargan. Panel member Page, good morning. And good morning. Turner. Please state your name and inmate number for the record. Uh, Craig Bettencourt, 243-978. This hearing is being conducted in consideration of the parole application for Craig Benicourt, inmate number 243-978. He is serving a sentence of 30 years jail, 20 years to serve, followed by three years of probation for manslaughter first and risk of injury to a child. As of today, records reflect a parole eligibility date of September 15, 2024. There is victim input in this case. There is an offender accountability plan for the offender. It has been reviewed and shows the offender has completed voices people empowering people and thresholds. Utilizing the statewide collaborative offender risk evaluation system, the offender's overall score falls within the low range of risk for recidivism. Mr. Benincourt, this is your opportunity to express to the board why you believe you should be granted parole. You may begin. Good morning. I'd like to start by saying to all the families, most of all, him and Loretta, I'm truly sorry for my decisions I made on September 17, 2007, and because of that decision, I caused a tragic loss of true Bemis. Because of the lack of better judgment, I caused all the family pain, pain that I could have been avoided if I had just been more responsible that night. There are things I could have and should have been done differently, such as focus on true more than Cassandra and then finish what I needed to get done that night. With a, what I was working on or just asking for help. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what I was working on or just asking for help, knowing what I was feeling. This shouldn't have happened. If I did my job as a father and uncle, being irresponsible, and for that, I'm sorry. The time I spent inside gave me the opportunities to learn and deal with the choices I made and going to have to make in the future. Between the programs I took, threshold voices, and going back to school, I only can ask for the opportunity for parole to show that I can be productive a member of society again, be a better person, use what I've learned in the path moving forward, think about the choices I make and will have to make what could be the outcome beforehand. How they might affect others and for myself. I'm not the same person I 17 years ago. I know I wasn't able to do everything on my own at the time and just for and just asking for help is all right. I want to show and prove I am a better person to the families and who and who would let me. Again, I am truly sorry. Yes, sir. So um, thank you very much for that opening statement. Um, we as a board have some questions that we'd like to ask you at this time. And then at the conclusion of those questions, we have input from Office of Victim Services. 
And then at the conclusion of those statements, we will uh, discuss your case and get back to you with our decision, okay? Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the, the information that's supplied to us, we receive a lot of information. Um, and we receive information on the, the underlying charge too, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, it was difficult to read. Um, and um, through the programming that you've taken, have you been able to understand maybe what was going on at, at the time of the offense? I mean, I've always understood, I mean, the choices that I made that day, always, uh, I still fight every day with what happened and I understand what I did wrong and what I said and what I did may have not lined up, but I know, I'm sorry, it, it, it still bothers me this day. I, I haven't forgot or what went on that day. I, I can't take back what I did. And I hate myself for it. I, I don't know. I, I just wanted to crawl up and die that day. Okay, so um, let me try to move on a little bit because it looks like your past criminal history you had a larceny and a bad check, right? And then, yes. but prior to that, it looks like your first offense was a reckless endangerment, right? Um, back in 1995. Oh, okay. I, that was um, we were shooting an air rifle out the window. was younger than me, so I didn't want him to get in trouble, so I took the blame for it, because it was my my rifle. And that's why um, so, I had that. It, it doesn't look like you have an issue at all with substance abuse, is that accurate? No, no I, I do not. I, I haven't had a drink since I was 23 years old. At the last, very last drink I had was when I found out um, I was going to have a daughter and my brother-in-law, we went and had one beer. That's the last time I actually had a drink. I was 24 years old. Okay. So, um, you know, we have uh, letters that we receive, um, you know, from loved ones too that, you know, that, uh, that we look at. And then uh, reading the, the, the police report is. I know, know, I made, I made two just, statements. I'm sorry, go ahead. I made two statements, the first statement, and then I made the second statement after they told me that she died. And it's like, I kept asking them, you know, what to do. I, I don't know what to do. How do I face anybody? And they weren't listening. And they're like, well, is there anything else you want to say? And, and I just took the first statement and I exaggerated all the way through. I'm like, I don't want to go home and face nobody. Even to this day, I talk to my family members. I'm still scared to go home and face them, knowing I, I fucked up. Excuse my language. Um, that I messed up. And I hate, I, like I said, I hate myself for it. And I'm still yeah. fighting with it. All right. Because, you know, uh, <clears throat> reading everything, what was concerning to me is 
that you left this <clears throat> very young child for 20 minutes alone, right? It, it didn't, I look back, it didn't feel like it was 20, I, I didn't feel like it was 20 minutes. I went and sat down and I had to doze off and it didn't yeah. feel like 20 minutes. I mean, I, I'm no expert with children, but uh, <clears throat> children, you can't let them out of your sight for one moment. You know, it just, no, I don't. it's just, uh, it's, yeah, it's, um, it, it's concerning to me, though, Mr. Benincourt. I'm going to turn it over at this time to my colleague, panel member, Turner, for some questions. So, Mr. Benincourt, um, The um, the indications in the police report was that you were frustrated with the child. She had had vomited. That wasn't frustrated, and I don't know why they said I wasn't frustrated. It, it's a normal thing. Um, she vomited on, on her on herself, so I was like, okay, she's sick. I'm gonna put her in a bath. I wasn't frustrated. They they made it seem like I was frustrated. I wasn't. I, I, I've raised my daughter and I've raised other nephews. I it, I wasn't frustrated. Okay. So um what what role did you play in this child's death? <sighs> um my inability to be responsible and focus on her getting her done first. Get her in the tub, get her washed up, go put her to bed. But I'm doing that and not focusing on that. I went and sat down, and that's the role I played. Okay, so it's your it's position my that, that this child drowned unattended in the bathtub. Yes. Um. So tell me about the statements to the police about using the sprayer hose on the tub, pointing it at her face and like I said, go ahead, I'm sorry, I'm sorry go ahead. contributing directly to her death. I, I don't know if that did. I mean, I didn't, and this is why I explained in my first statement. I washed her hair, I, I rinsed her down. I didn't do nothing excessive until after they told me that she died. And I'm like, I don't want to go home. I, I'm asking for help and you guys are not listening. And they're like, well, she died. Okay, we're gonna let you go. It's like, no, I don't want you to let me go. I, I don't know how to face the family. I don't have, know how to face the loved ones. I fucked, I messed up really bad. Yeah. Um, Washing her up, that was just a normal routine. I didn't overdo it. I just hated myself for what happened. The fact that I left her is, is why she died. Okay. So when you told the police that, um, that after spraying her for a pro prolonged period of time in her face with the jets running in the tub that the victim no longer had any fight, you just made that up? I don't remember saying no fight. I, I, I think I was just, like I said, I was just, Doing anything that not have to face the family. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just, I would I, have expected I, I, at I, I this know. point in your finishing, you know, your your sentence that that there would be some active responsibility for the no, role I, you played in contributing directly to her death. No, I, I am fully responsible. There's there's no there's no one else responsible. I've I've said it to my family. At the end of the day, I was responsible. I was the last line of defense to make sure she was safe. I, I wish I could go back and change things. I can't. I, I hate I myself. Don't, I don't. The way this reads, sir, is not an act of neglect, but a deliberate act to take this child's life. That's how it, it is I know, documented in the police reports. I know, and that's 
You what lost I control and you tortured this child in the tub until she died. I didn't. I. I didn't torture her. I felt with the like, water, with the hose. I, I know. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I. I don't know how much I can say. I hate myself for what happened. It's just. I don't. I didn't want to see the family. I. They let me go to go outside okay. and I, I seen Eric Bemis and I lost it. I was like, I can't face the rest of the family. So I went back and I just exaggerated the whole story at the end. And I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm so what did you, what did you end up telling your daughter about why you're in prison? We have our conversation and she knows that um, I messed up and because of my ill responsibility, not so much in the words. It's like I'm okay. here to do this. So it's do my neglect. Punishment. She, you've you've told her you neglected to take proper care of this child, yes. and that's why she died. That's that's yes. Okay. All right. Um, so you have a 30 year sentence with 20 years to serve. So when you are end of sentence, you have 10 years of this sentence hanging over your head while you go out to probation and you have three years of probation um, to uh, help you transition back into the community. Um, do you have any plans for work, sir? Um, so I have the sponsor and then my sponsor lives 15 minutes from my sister-in-law, which works um, works for a job, the job placement companies. So she said she will help me out, get a job, get me on my feet, um, and get back to work. And if there's anything else I need to do as far as uh, disability or uh, just trying to do right for everybody and get back on my feet the right way. All right, I have no more questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't remember Paige. No questions. Thank you, Chair. So at this time, we're going to turn the um, turn it over to Office of Victim Services for input at this time. Uh, thank you, Office of Victim Services. Good morning, board members. I do have um, the victims. Uh, maternal grandparent and paternal grandparent. Um, I'm going to ask that the paternal grandparent unmute his phone and this is your opportunity to express to the board your wishes and your concerns. I am to remind you that you are to address the panel members only and you may begin. Hi. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I said paternal grandparent. My apologies. Is that me, hon? No. Oh. One second, board members. Sorry. Mr. Bemis, if you could unmute yourself and you may begin with your statement. Yes, you may begin with your statement. I am to remind you that you will address the panel members only and you may begin. Hello, this is James Bemis, uh, whose paternal grandfather. Um, I would like to make a statement that I'm not sure how to approach other than what I found out about Trues drowning. All right. I worked with some of the Mr. finest Bemis, documents. Mr. Beeman, yes. this is your opportunity to express to the panel your wishes and your concerns. I am. I am. I believe that Craig should be given his parole. I do believe that he had um, circumstances as far as not watching her, but I do not believe that he drowned her. Yeah. And I have concerns that uh, um, 
you know, that he should be he should be paroled. The things that I found out that I was told that I could not talk about, and um, other than I know my granddaughter did not drown. You know, I just I'm just concerned that he's in jail way too long for uh, a neglect charge, which is the only thing that should have been charged against him. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, do you want me to talk about the grounding? No, we just, uh, it, we heard your statement um, uh, and, and you're in favor of uh, parole. That's yes, correct. Yes, I am. Right? Okay. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank, thank you very I, much. I mean, so, so thank so you for your input. All right. Well, so is the rest of my family concerned that he should be paroled. All right. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you, Mr. Thank Dean. you. You You're may welcome. continue to you may continue to listen. Board members, I do also have the maternal grandmother on the line. This is your this also is your opportunity to express to the board your wishes and your concerns. I am to remind you that you're to address the panel members only, and you may begin. Hi, I'm True's maternal grandmother. The, the way True was taken from us um, was devastating. Um, you know, We don't get to see her grow up. We don't get to see her have her graduation. It was taken away from us because of anger, frustration. Um, we were told by the prosecutor that Mr. Beckincourt had held True's head under the water, put her face in front of the jet until there was no life left in her. He then went downstairs and watched football and then came up and ended up calling 911, stating there was no response out of true. Um, we don't get to see her get married. We don't get to see her have her first child. Everything and that baby's life was taken from us. Um, Drew was a very happy-go-lucky person, and um, and um, you know, it was just. I mean, you could be as mad as you could be to the world, and that baby would make you forget about how angry or what you were angry about because she brought the spirit back within yourself. Um, I had taken through some clothing one time while I was up there and they did not respond like they were supposed to to pick up the clothing. I in turn called Mr. Beckincourt ended up stating that we could come over for a few minutes. 
Sue heard my voice and she came running and jumping up in my arms. I love you, Grandma. I love you, Grandma. I said, I know you do, Pumpkin. And I said, Grammy loves you. Well, when he said that I had to go, Sue started screaming and crying like she was so terrified of Mr. Beckencourt. I called Children's Services and I told them that it was not a safe environment, that they needed to get my granddaughter out of there. Well, as you can see, they didn't react to my plea. And because of that, um, Mr. Beckencourt took things in his own hands and took my granddaughter's life at 27 months old. A 27-month-old baby is not, you know, knowing not to cry. She's human, and she had the right to cry. She was terrified. I mean, he had to pull her out of my arms so I could leave to go back to Florida where I lived at the time. And I do not, I repeat, I do not feel that he has served enough time for taking a life from a child. I feel that not only should he remain for the next two years, I ask the board to please make him serve the rest. I mean, the 20 years and all because one stipulation by the prosecutor is he is not allowed to be around nobody under the age of 18. You know, um, the prosecutor guaranteed me that he would not be able to see his grandchildren unless they are 18. He is not allowed to hang around to where there is children pleasant, I mean, present, you know, and I really, my daughter, Loretta Lynn, her mother, has passed away with missing through so bad. True was the only child she ever wanted. And like I said, that baby was tore away from her arms. You know, Everything has been taken from us. I had a, I've got a granddaughter that's six months older than, well, younger than True. And when we told her that she was the oldest, she said, Grammy, what happened to True True? 
and <clears throat> sit there and try and explain it to a child that she was murdered and she was taken from us. It was hard for her to understand because of her age. But I just don't, I feel he should serve the 20 years that's left and the two years that's left on this sentence. That is really all I've got to say. Thank you very much. We're all Thank you. Something? Yeah. Okay. So, um, OVS, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Betancourt, give us a few moments. You can listen in as we <clears throat> discuss your case, okay? Um, so, for me, anyways, um, you know, it, it, the underlying offense is, is difficult. I said that to him at the beginning. Uh, there's a couple of different opinions there with OVS. Uh, you know, this is his uh, first prison sentence. You know, he's taken a, a number of programs, but uh, within to the last uh, speaker, it's, it's too much at this time for me to overcome. I, I have him going to end the sentence uh, for, for the nature and circumstance of the offense and injury and impact on for the victims of victims family. But that's just my thought process. And at this time, I, I would turn it over to my colleague, uh, panel member Turner for additional input. Um, I'm in full agreement, Mr. Chair. I would ask you to add uh, inadequate evidence of offender change okay. to the reasons. Um, very disturbing crime and um, uh, resulting in a, in a tremendous amount of pain for various family members. Okay, thank you very much, Pamela. Okay. okay, so... And in the case of Greg Betancourt, inmate number 243975, there's a motion at this time to deny early release for the following nature and or circumstance of current offense, injury and or impact on the victims or the victim's family, and inadequate evidence of offender change. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, Mr. Betancourt, well, you'll be getting this information in the next couple of weeks. Okay. All done. You're all set. Thank you. It's disturbing. It is just disturbing. He's put in charge. He's a it's his fiance's niece. It's not his blood relative. Somehow he ends up in charge of taking care of her. It seems that the parents and grandparents dropped her off after spending the day with her. He then puts her in the bath and tortures her. We're going to go over the court documents, both pre-trial and then post-sentencing. And we'll see exactly what it is that he told the police and in the context that he told it. And when you read this, if you needed any additional information, it's just utter nonsense that he didn't do it. But we so often see that these monsters, they, they come in pairs. They have, they have some type of relative that is in denial along with them, and it doesn't help the situation. The idea that you would claim that he, to, to the same excuse he used today. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I was just neglectful. The only mistake I did was that I wasn't being responsible. I left her in the bathtub. Well, then why did you tell the police that you tortured her? 
no, no, no. I, I only told the police that because I felt so bad. I felt so bad. They, see, they kept wanting to release me from jail, but I felt so bad. I, I wanted to stay in jail, so I made it up. And it's like, out of all confession excuses and stories, that is probably has got to be the worst. You know, there are a lot of people that claim they were coerced into confession. This is why they confess that. But no, no, I felt so bad. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Ridiculous. And I do like the way the parole board handled this. We have seen, this might have been the best parole hearing that we've seen, the way the parole board handled, handled it. They actually asked what happened. They asked him, of, I mean, I, I, it's, it's weird that I have to talk about this, but they don't do that in Connecticut. You know, Louisiana, they would, but in Connecticut, they don't push someone in, kind of in the corner and, make, and hold them accountable. And I think a lot of that had to do with Turner, who we don't see that often. She's more of the, on the elderly side with the white short here um, and glasses. And I'll read you about her bio later in, in this hearing if you're curious to learn more about her. But I did like, she even at the end said that part, she added the, the note on his rejection that he didn't take accountability. Now he's going to get out no matter what now. And just to, this entire hearing was about, I think, two years. He's getting out in 2026. So the entire process was just for two years. And then he gets out after having served 20 years. And then he has 10 years of special parole. But now let's go through the documents. And thank you, Richard, for providing it. So he was charged. This is when he was first charged. Um, and I'm going to call him, I'm going to call him Craig instead of his last name. I just so Craig is charged with murder of risk to uh, injury to a minor. And because the victim was under the age of 16, she was just two. A lot of the legislation is written like, oh, 16, that's the cutoff. So it's capital felony. The latter carries the possibility of the death penalty. I didn't realize Connecticut still carries the death penalty. I thought, I, who knows the last time they actually charged anyone with it. And that's a whole different argument, by the way. But anyways, okay. Um, although prosecutors Paul and Stephen have opted not to pursue the death penalty in this case, according to the court records, police responding to 911 call to the Groton home um, at 10.30 p.m. arrived to find Craig crying over the little girl's body in the basement. The child was lying on her back naked with wet hair and showed signs of having vomited recently. And this is especially close to home. My mother grew up in Groton, Connecticut. I spent many, many, many um, trips in Groton, Connecticut. So this is close. This is close to home. Um, Craig. told police that he had left the child in the bathtub a number of times that evening to attend to his seven-year-old daughter, to check his email, to watch football, and to get a soda. He returned to find her unresponsive in the bathtub, and at that point, he said he tried to resuscitate her and called 911. Groton Town Police Officer also attempted to revive her until the EMTs arrived, but she was pronounced deceased at the hospital. The little girl was the niece of his fiance, and according to the court record, she had lived with the couple since October of 2006. And this occurred again in September of 2007, so a year. Um, and then, so, and she, the, the victim had spent the day with her parents and her grandparents. Um, Craig, okay, Craig told police that she had been feeling sick when her grandfather dropped her off and gave her a bath to clean her up after she vomited. During an interview with the Groton Town Police Department later that night, however, um, Craig told a different story. The one that he originally gave police. Oh, different from the one he originally gave police. According to testimony presented at the probable cause hearing in March 2008, when police told him that she had passed away, uh, Craig iterated that he had killed the baby. He used the words he had tortured the baby. He was responsible for her care and he failed her. 
Craig told police that he had become frustrated by the little girl's crying as he gave her a bath, and in an attempt to quell it, he repeatedly sprayed her in the face with a nozzle from the jacuzzi tub. According to court documents, he continued even when he knew that she was coughing and having a hard time breathing. I mean, you just, you can't even just reading it. And not that being, you know, a, a, a drug addict or an alcoholic would be an excuse, but but it, it's even more disturbing when you find out that he's completely sober when he's doing this. How do you have so much rage? She's crying for her mommy. And, and, and it's just... How does someone like this not get life? And he's being coddled now by people that think he, that that it was all made up, which means that he's going to be put around, you know. And that's what the victim wanted. Just please don't allow him. Now, he's not allowed to be around children under the age of 16, not 18, but um, it's still terrifying. Someone with this much rage is going to be out in just two years. He pushed her into the tub. He said, until the fight went out of her. This is, these were his words. You don't make this stuff up. <laughs> until the fight was out of her. A two-year-old. He's talking about a two-year-old girl. Craig said that said when he left her, she was laying with her face out of the water and with one arm on the tub's armrest but he thought she was breathing. When he returned 20 minutes later, he found her unresponsive and called for help. Chief medical examiner, Dr. Dwayne Carver, who conducted the autopsy, determined that the cause of death was asphyxia due to submersion and rolled it a homicide. Craig's murder trial is set to begin November 1st. For Charles' family, um, is time coming. The child's maternal grandmother, um, Andrea, wrote a number of letters to the court asking the judge to move the case forward so the family could have some closure. She had a whole life ahead of her, and he took away from all of us. In the letter she wrote, we need this matter to be over and means. Um, what a tragedy for her, the grandmother we heard. The grandmother lost her daughter after this and her granddaughter. Talk about just complete pain. This is now after he took this. So he took a plea deal. They waited up until a month before the trial, and he took a plea deal. And now we're going to read from the plea deal and it gets into more information about how he was still insisting on his innocence, even at the plea deal, which of course is something you don't do. Um, but it's also something you don't do in your parole hearing. And uh, anyways, in, according with, in accordance with reached on September 29, 2011, the first day of the jury selection, originally scheduled Clifford sentenced a 37 year old Groton man to 30 years suspended after 20 to be, um, to 30 years, suspended after 20, to be followed by three years probation, during which he will be allowed only supervised contact with minor children. It was a sentence that split the family in two and which in the end, Judge Clifford acknowledged probably satisfied no one. Relatives on the maternal side of her family, including the child's mother and maternal grandmother, asked the judge to impose a lengthier sentence and had harsh words for him at sentencing, calling him a monster, which is what he is, and saying they hoped he would rot in hell. 20 years isn't enough, said her mother, Loretta. She was full of happiness. All she did was cry for mommy, and he killed her for it. I have never felt more rage than I do today, thinking he'll see his daughter in 20 years. Relatives on the paternal side of the family, including a statement read by the defense um, of her father, of, from her father's Timothy, asked the judge for leniency. That is, it's so, it's so shocking that that would happen, right? I mean, the three-year-old girl's father asked for leniency. Paternal grandfather James spoke highly of. Um, spoke highly of Craig. I, I just, this is the same man who spoke highly of Craig now. Um, telling the court how he had been a kind and caring father figure. Kim and her fiance had custody 
um, of her for the last year of her short life because the girl's parents lived um, in a bottle of alcohol. What happened was a pure accident, he said. There's no way anyone on earth is going to tell me he did this. Craig, who called 911 after finding um, her unconscious, initially told police the drowning was an accident that happened um, when he left her unattended bathtub to watch part of a football game, get a soda, and check his email. In a rather unusual move for a sentencing hearing, the defense asked that a recording of the 911 call made to police be entered into evidence. And this is the defense bringing this call into evidence. On the four-minute tape of distraught, um, Craig, sorry, could be heard trying to revive a child from mouth to mouth breathing in CPR. The defense also said the results of the lie detector test, which are not admissible in court, showed that he was telling the truth when he said he did not kill her. However, the contradicts the statement he gave to, to um, police. And uh, that's the bottom line. I don't, well, I don't trust lie detector. I think lie detector tests are, the, are a joke. That's my personal opinion of them. And um, the idea that he was panicking on that one, one call also, it just, you know, it could mean that he was genuinely panicking for himself, not for her, right? He, he realized that his life is over. You simply don't go into a police station and make up details of how you tortured her if you didn't do it. He, 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 that that's all that matters. Uh, yeah. oh, I'm sure that they'll find some type of expert that will say, no, people do. Okay, I don't buy it. And it's crazy that the father and grandfather actually could trust him. It just is bizarre. When police told, told him that she was dead, he said that he had used the jacuzzi nozzle to spray the crying child in the face, then left her lying limply face up in the tub, and a statement to police um, said that he killed her. Defense attorney Fred DiCaprio and William Koch told Coach told the court a psychological evaluation had found the client was highly suggestible and inclined to assume responsibility for events that were not actually his fault. I love to see this is exactly what I'm talking about. They always bring in a, a psychological expert. That another thing that is a sham in the legal system is how you'll always have the defense and the prosecution each bring in their experts to make a statement. And it's 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 laughable because the bottom line, it's like, well, I'm paying them to say what I want them to say. And it I think it's an insult against the profession. Really, I do. The whole expert thing is a joke. For the most part. I'm sure there are exceptions, but confession was damning evidence against him um uh faced a life sentence if convicted a trial pleaded nolo contende uh to one count of manslaughter which is no contest in the first degree and one count of risk of injury to minor nolo contende means that uh he will not admit his guilt he concedes that he that the state has sufficient evidence to win a conviction and i guess if this was his technical plea then he does have some kind of argument at his parole hearing. I'm saying from a legal perspective. Senior Assistant State Attorney Paul Narducci told the court he did not believe that her death was an accident. However, he said that he did not think that um, he intended to kill a girl, and the judge agreed. I may not be can I may not be convinced a jury would find you guilty of murder, but I don't see it as an accident. Clifford said, "I think this is a reasonable disposition. No one." Um, None of us are ever going to be sure what happened. There are no, there's no way to make this right by sentencing, Clifford said, adding that there was really no sentence that could compensate the tragic loss of such a young life. The victim will never be whole again. My heart goes out to everybody involved. I like what this judge had to say overall. Um, and I like that the judge gave not the maximum sentence, but it was a, you know, it was a good, um, we have seen in Louisiana people get away, I think, with lighter sentences. So it was, but it was 20 years and then 10 years of probation. Now, the bottom line is, is that I do believe that he intentionally, now maybe it wasn't intentional. He thought that he was going to kill her, but I believe he intentionally tortured her. And he just didn't think that she would, um, she would die. And... 
Um, but do I think someone like this should ever get out? No, I don't have any. I don't have any feelings for someone who uh, who does this to a little child. There's something very deep and dangerous uh, and wrong with them, and there's no benefit, in my opinion, of them entering, re-entering society. Um, and it, you know, it seemed to me the only time that he showed emotion was. I mean, I guess it was near the end, but I, I felt like he was crying for himself and not for, for the victim. He even laughed in his opening statement, chuckled, um, and took no accountability. But he'll be getting out in two years, and pretty scary thought. Thank you, Richard, for providing the information. And with that, I'll let you go.